to this year's critical issues in energy series that UH Energy is presenting. Today's topic is timely and perhaps really important as we start to look at the energy transition uh, for the world, but more importantly for the city of Houston. Carbon capture utilization and storage is the topic that we're gonna talk about. I'm Ramanan Krishnamurthy, Chief Energy Officer here at the University of Houston, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the symposium. This study uh, and this symposium uh, is a result of a study uh, that we have carried out in collaboration with uh, the, the Center for Houston's Future, the uh, Gutierrez Energy Management Institute in the Bauer College of Business uh, and uh, UH Energy. And this forms the basis of us uh, having this discussion today. And the, and the topic that we researched was how does Houston become the low carbon energy capital of the world. And we've looked at four different axes. Uh, today's topic, which is CCUS, uh, topics that we will discuss uh, on all the three succe successive Fridays uh, will be on low carbon electricity grid, hydrogen, and the circular plastics economy. If you wanna learn more about the study and the research that was carried out, I uh, encourage you to visit uh, the website, uh, uh, UH Energy website, uh, this web address that gives you uh, a brief synopsis of the study, the key results that we found, and uh, some of the slides uh, that we've used in the presentations today, as well as uh, in, in succeeding uh, conversations. Uh, we want to thank a few people for the work that has been done here, and this includes our partners at the Center for Houston's Future. Uh, as I mentioned, the Bauer College of Business and the Gutierrez Energy Management Institute. And specifically, Brett Perlman, Laura Goldberg at CHF, Greg Bean at GEMI, and Jeannie Kiever at the University of Houston. We also want to thank Texas Industrial Energy Efficiency Program for helping us promote this event. Uh, without further ado, I want to get you started off on the key results that, uh, that we've, we've gathered. And the person who led the charge for the CCUS vertical uh, was none other than our own Charles McConnell. Chuck is the Energy Center Officer at the University of Houston. He's also the Executive Director for our Center for Carbon Management in Energy and uh, has a, an illustrious uh, history uh, in this area. And perhaps most noteworthy, he is seen as the person who put the U into CCUS. He highlighted the need for utilization as a key point of how you get monetization to occur in carbon capture and storage. So without further ado, Chuck, Chuck over to you. Um, thanks, uh, very, uh, very generous introduction. Appreciate it very much. Uh, of course, there's nothing I'd rather do than spend time with all of you talking about CCUS. Uh, but I, in this case, I think it's also important to recognize that for the last six months, we've had a fantastic group of students that we've pulled together for this. Next slide, please. Uh, those students, Patty Hernandez, Brad Purifor, and Mock Paul, sorry, Ed have been very, very important in, in our effort. They've worked tirelessly, put a lot of focus on it. And, and this, is, this is the kind of group of students that makes our university proud. Uh, they've done a tremendous amount of job. They've, again, put a lot of effort into it. And, and I think to a person would also say they've, they've learned a lot. Next slide, please. So let's get right into it because there's nothing more important than understanding why, what, and, and, and how Houston can, can be a part of this in terms of a CCUS hub. So let's start at the beginning. Why CCUS? It's recognized internationally by the IEA and the IPCC that CCUS is essential to meeting global climate targets. Uh, we, have, we can get immediate emissions reductions from decarbonization of the hydrocarbon industries that are so big here in this area. And we can't hit emission targets globally with just a clean energy renewable strategy. 
Decarbonization of the hydrocarbon industry is essential because we have to continue to provide affordable, reliable, sustainable energy globally. So what are the impacts here? Well, it's certainly the long-term sustainability of the hydrocarbon industries, but it's really more than that. It sets the stage for Houston to be a decarbonization center for the United States. And it, it's a globally recognized opportunity for the knowledge and skill sets and technologies that will be a part of this CCUS global deployment. And low carbon products from our area will ultimately be advantaged in a global marketplace because whether or not you've declared going to net zero or not, the hydrocarbon industry is faced with the, the, the challenges that are faced with the energy transition and, and CCUS becomes an underpinning effort in, in that regard. And frankly, why Houston? Well, we're the energy capital of the world. We say it all the time, but we really need to become the sustainable, low-carbon energy capital of the world. We've got infrastructure and scale here that are suitable for cluster economics, frankly, unmatched anywhere in the world, but also unmatched are the vast proximal geologic storage resources that we have, both for enhanced oil recovery and storage. And the energy companies that are in our town well, they know that they're moving into this energy transition and whether they've declared net zero or approaching net zero or whatever the case may be, we're all driving in the same direction here in this town. We know there's a transition and CCUS is a big part of it. Next slide, please. So the objectives were for us to take a phased approach, a 10 year, three by 10 year approach in terms of the deployment analysis for our region and we took the NPC national analysis construct and we brought it down to ground level and regionalized it for Houston. We're looking at the emissions and the economic investment necessary. It isn't just one or the other, it's both. And it's fundamental to the analysis of understanding how to make this work in terms of business and emissions reductions. And the other thing about it was to look at the optionality around CCUS. Whether you go to storage, whether you go to EOR, or whether you do both, you provide for a, a portfolio opportunity. And, and also what we've seen is there's a tremendous impact for the rest of the country, and frankly, the rest of the world in terms of what we have to offer. So the next part of it were the findings. As you advance the slide to the findings, there we go. The investment and risk hurdles will require strategic investment. It's not wildly accretive investment, but it's strategic. But the other important part is it's not a money loser. And that's critical. And that's why the Houston area provides this for the industries to look at in a very, very good way, strategically. We have a mix of EOR and pure storage that gives us that portfolio approach for CCUS. And the current base of target geologies and infrastructure options are far greater than just the stationary emissions in the Houston area. It's a long-term play for the Gulf Coast, frankly, for the United States, and perhaps even for the world. But we will need federal, state, and local governmental policies to support this. We'll speak to that in our research, and you'll hear a bit more about it. But that's not the only thing. It's part of the solution. So let me hand off the presentation to one of our key students, Mark Paul, and, uh, and we'll move into the next slide. Thank you very much for the introduction, Mr. McConnell. In order for us to approach the project, we divided it into three value chain chains of CCUS. Each person took a component of the value chain to harmonize it across the research. Myself, I'm focusing on the carbon, uh, carbon capture, patio on transportation, and Brad on storage. Since this US is still in the early stages of deployment, because of that, there are some challenges, risks, barriers in each of these value chains. And they are very important for us to understand as well as to address and overcome. For example, a major challenge in carbon capture is the cost of implementation of technologies to capture CO2. It accounts for 75% of the total CCS cost. For transportation, major challenges are permits and regulations to build out the pipelines. 
And for storage primacy, class six wells require some time to get the permit approval for environmental protection agency in order, to, in order for us to store the CO2. Now in this project, our goal is to get to Houston to net zero by 2050. And in the following slide, we have a waterfall chart that generated by using the data provided from Gaffney Klein, which includes different facility types and volumes. These volumes are specific to several county area that we were giving in the data for. There, there is 52 million tons per year that are being emitted from Houston and it's too much for us to get into in one go. Therefore, we divided in the next 30 years in three phases following the National Petroleum Council study as a guide. For activation phase one, concentrating on from present to 2030, counties and density of emissions from industrial facilities allowed us to focus on all provided hydrogen plants and more than half of natural gas power plants. For expansion two, concentrated from 2030 to 2040, we are incorporating the remaining natural gas power plants and more than half of industrial furnaces facilities. Furthermore, for net zero phase three, focused from 2040 to 2050, we are including the remaining of the industrial furnaces and all provided refinery catalytic cracker facilities. In addition, we do recognize that the greater Gulf Coast and greater exp expansive opportunity that the region provides us goes beyond those counties. And this work can serve as a foundational methodology that could be used to tackle larger region and could be strong leverage tool going forward for the continued expansive view of the Gulf Coast and the industries. Therefore, this is how we framed our initial ground level analysis of how we might take Houston to get to the net zero by 2050. Now I will hand it over to Patty to speak about the details of activation phase for 2030. Thank you, Maka. Here in phase one, we're taking advantage of an existing asset that's unique to Houston. In the activation phase, it was our particular interest on capturing all of the hydrogen in phase one because we discovered that it had the lowest capture cost. And we then plan on targeting half of the natural gas power plants. The reason why we're focusing on those facilities in phase one is due to an increase in pressure from investors to decarbonize. So it must be done quickly. Therefore, those facilities are a good target for the activation phase. The emissions that are going to be captured from those facilities will fill up the available uh, capacity of the Denbury pipeline that is going to travel from south of Houston into East Texas, Mississippi, and will be primarily utilized for EOR. There's currently 13 million tons a year available capacity in the pipeline. We also discovered that through capture and transport, the total investment will be $3.72 billion in the Houston economy. In the following slide, as you can see in this image, in the activation phase, we have a large expanse to where this pipeline can reach to. There's currently 1.4 billion tons of UR storage and 1.5 trillion saline storage available in the Gulf Coast. One of the reasons why we chose EOR is that it's economic. Um, as we'll show you in, in our economic model that we built. Also, the Denver pipeline has identified multiple ER fields along the pipeline. But eventually, we'll also look at being able to access offshore storage as we begin to expand our research in the area as well. As you'll see in our research, we expanded our networks, we expanded our reach that allow us to go into other areas that have capacities far beyond what we have in the greater Houston area. After phase one, we are going to capture the remaining emissions during phase two and phase three. We plan on building a pipeline into East Texas and the Permian due to the large amount of storage availability. You'll be able to see uh, the same charts and maps in our appendix as you look through your information. But also let me transfer this over to Brad to talk about our economic model. All right, yeah, thank you, Patty. Um, so, so what uh, she just gave us was an overview of our uh, plan for the phase one activation um, in, in Houston. And what we, what we did for phase one, uh, we also built an economic model that looks at the entire value chain of CCUS from capture uh, all the way through transport and storage uh, to see how economic um, these types of projects are today and will be over the next 10 years. So um, this economic model is, is pretty detailed and it's too detailed to go um, into in any depth, uh, but there's a screenshot of it at the bottom. And what I wanna do here is just give you a brief overview of the framework, uh, some of the assumptions, uh, and then also some of the scenarios that we ran with it. Um, 
it's a very it's a very powerful tool that we generated. So essentially, it's just a discounted cash flow model. And I want to reiterate that it only includes uh, phase one. So that's hydrogen facilities and, and natural gas facilities. And those captured emissions will be transported on the Denbury pipeline and primarily used in EOR uh, storage, enhanced oil recovery. Um, but one thing that we can do in this model is we've allowed for the functionality to actually toggle between um, the ratio of saline storage and enhanced oil recovery. So if you wanted to run a scenario where uh, say 50% of the captured emissions go to saline storage and 50% go to EOR, uh, you could do that. And the outputs of this model are net present value and uh, IRR. So some of the assumptions that go, that feed into this discounted cash flow model are um, the same as the uh, NPC study that was done a few years ago. We wanted to stay consistent with that methodology. Uh, but we did, we did tailor it to the Houston area um, by using regional gas and electricity costs that were kindly provided to us by uh, Gaffney Klein. So the discount rate used in the base case model was 12%. And I guess another important point is that we inflated uh, oil gas and the cost of electricity out annually to the end of the project. So we had a base case, um, well, we had two base case scenarios. One was a 100% EOR storage scenario. And the second was a 100% saline storage scenario. And what we did was we varied uh, the inputs in both of those base case models to determine uh, which parameters impacted project MPB and IRR the most. And we also did sensitivity analyses around oil price and the rate that 45Q needs to be to make projects economic. So if we can go into the next slide, I can show you the results of uh, some of that work. Okay, so this, uh, the results that we're seeing here are from the 100% enhanced oil recovery uh, base case model and the scenarios that we ran on, on that model. Um, and the reason that we chose EOR is because currently um, EOR projects uh, in today's time can be NPV positive and have a 12% IRR, which is pretty impressive. So the, the table on the left-hand side of the screen uh, outlines all of the inputs that go into our base case model. And then the green highlighted area are the outputs from that base case model. So we, you can see that we have a, a positive MPV and an IRR of 12%. Now, one thing that we need to note here is that in order for this project to be positive, it does require uh, a $40 per barrel uh, WTI price um, for the life of the project. Um, so there is, there is high risk to these projects due to um, the volatility of, of commodity prices. Uh, so now as we look at the um, tornado chart on the right, this shows the results of our sensitivity analysis. So what we did was we, um, all, all the parameters are listed down the right hand side of the chart and we varied each of those parameters up 25% and down 25% and then saw how that impacted the project NPV. So what this shows you uh, is, is which parameters have the biggest impact on the project. And what we can see is that uh, by, by far, oil price and the amount of oil recovered per ton of CO, CO2 injected into the ground are the biggest drivers of, of project economics. Uh, in addition to those two parameters, there's also natural gas power plant capex, the 45Q rate, and the hydrogen capture capex that also can swing the, the project quite significantly. Um, so we also did a 100% saline storage case. Uh, I'm not going to present those results now, but they are included in the appendix if you would like uh, to see that, that those results. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, I can just briefly wrap up um, what 
our plan for a net zero uh, Houston looks like. Uh, again, we, we break it into three phases. The first of which is the activation phase, uh, which takes us from 2020 to 2030. Uh, here we're going to capture uh, hydrogen and natural gas power plant emissions, transport those emissions on uh, existing midstream infrastructure through the Denbury pipeline and uh, utilize Gulf Coast geologic storage um, to use enhanced oil recovery and saline storage uh, to permanently store the, the, the captured CO2 volumes. Second phase, if you click forward, um, will take us, yeah, will take us out into uh, 2040. And, and this will be our expansion phase. Uh, here, we, you know, expand our, our capture uh, across Houston. Uh, but for but for midstream transport, we're actually going to to build a 250 mile pipeline to East Central Texas to take uh, advantage of the vast geologic resources there for storage. Uh, and then phase three, um, which will get us to 2050, and this is the broad deployment phase. Uh, we basically throw a la lasso around the remaining emissions in Houston. Uh, here we plan on building a, pi a, a another pipeline to the Permian, uh, which will be about 500 miles long, cost about a billion dollars. But what that gives us is access to more than a trillion tons of combined EOR and, uh, and saline storage. And hopefully that'll bring uh, Houston to, to net zero using carbon capture and storage, uh, utilization and storage. Uh, so with that, we'll, we'll wrap up our portion of the presentation. And we would also like to thank uh, a few people and, and organizations. So if we can go forward one more slide. Yeah, I personally like to acknowledge um, Mike Godek and Steve Melzer for, for their uh, help on, on our research. So we'd like to thank um, James Sugar for from BP for giving us um, so much advice and, and information on our research. In addition, we'd like to recognize Scott Nyquist for the guidance and support. Special thanks to Nigel for providing us the cost model that played a critical role in this project, especially when creating our own economical model and structure. Overall, we greatly appreciate all our mentors for giving us an opportunity to interact with you from an industry standpoint. Thank you very much. Yeah, and we'd also like to thank Charles McConnell as well, our, our uh, team mentor. Well, that's very kind of you, Brad. Appreciate it. I think for everybody listening in today, it's pretty obvious. Uh, you know, I, I, I try to spend as much time as I can around really smart people. And in this case, I was certainly blessed this whole this whole summer and was certainly looking forward to our panel that we're they're moving into next. So thank the three of you tremendously for your efforts and and hopefully you'll be a part of the CCUS community for the rest of your careers uh, and I, I, I mean that sincerely. Let me turn it over now to uh, to our moderator for our panel uh, which will be Scott Nyquist and he can introduce the panelists to you and uh, Scott why don't you take it away. Well, thank you much, Chuck, for that introduction and uh, welcome and, and thanks to everyone for uh, participating in this discussion. And uh, also special thanks for the, to the students for this really fantastic work. It, it's uh, just a great contribution to our community and it'll help us in, in many ways as we plot a way to, to help uh, the greater Houston area and the Gulf Coast region uh, it, you know, reduce its overall emissions and get to this uh, net zero carbon world we're all uh, striving to move toward. So let me quickly just describe what we're gonna do for the next uh, hour until the session closes. And you know, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna provide some opening remarks, then introduce our panelists. We'll get our panelists to, to get us started with some of their thoughts, and then we'll open it up to, to uh, this discussion. And uh, as you can see in the slides, please uh, submit any questions you have, uh, and hopefully the, the system will work and we'll be able to incorporate your questions in, in the Q&A session. And then uh, uh, toward the end, we'll draw some conclusions and uh, Ramnan will, will close it out for us. So maybe just 
let me get started just uh, uh, as a way to introduce the uh, discussion and, and compliment the work that we just heard. I thought it might be useful just to frame just how important the carbon capture use and storage is to the future of, of energy. You know, the firm I work for, McKinsey Company, has just done a lot of work on climate change and various pathways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And we have found that in almost every you know, practical pathway that gets to a world with a stable and unmanageable net zero carbon energy system, carbon capture use and storage plays a really vital role. It is the backstop that makes it possible to, to get there. You can't make it happen just with uh, you know, wind and solar. It, it takes a lot more than that to get us there. Now, the International Energy Agency just came out with a very good report that highlights the four unique benefits of carbon capture and storage that links very closely to the work the students just presented. I thought I'd quickly summarize those just uh, as we, we get into the content. Now, first of all, CCUS really enables greenhouse gas emissions capture from existing infrastructure. Rather than rebuilding the entire global power and industrial system, CCUS can be used to retrofit a bolt on. And the students did a very good job showing in a real world sense, practically, how you could take existing infrastructure, add bits of investment, that can generate some reasonable returns with the right economic support and make this happen. This is much, much cheaper than if we had to kind of completely reinvent the system. The second uh, area that IEA highlights is that CCUS is a solution for some of those challenging emissions reductions. You know, heavy industry account for 20% of global emissions. And in some cases, CCUS is really the only practical solution to get there. For example, in cement, uh, CCUS may be the only technology that can really make it happen. And of course, in chemicals and refining, which are so important to Houston, as our students demonstrated, CCUS leveraging the existing pipeline is a practical way to kind of make this happen. Without CCUS, it would be phenomenally expensive to get, get this done. Third, and a very important uh, point is that CCUS is a cost-effective way to create low carbon hydrogen production. And again, that was highlighted in the students' work. A lot of the hydrogen uh, uh, applications that they put forward for CCUS could play a, a vital role to the, the long-term energy economy because hydrogen will play a uniquely important role in several niche segments in industry, buildings, power applications, transport to help us get to a, a net zero carbon energy system. And the final area that uh, IEA highlights, which didn't come out in the, the student's report, is CCUS can be used to remove carbon directly from the atmosphere. This is a very expensive technology. It may be phase four in, in the student's work. We let them go for another, <laughs> another month or two. But this would be um, uh, the, the really the last resort to clean up a CO2 that we just can't get in any other system. So CCUS plays a vital role in helping the world move toward a net zero carbon energy. And of course, Houston and the Gulf Coast region will play a vital role in scaling up. So now let me just uh, shift to our, our panelists and, uh, and let me just introduce them first and then we'll uh, move toward each one uh, providing a, a, a initial thoughts on this. I'll go through this quickly. You get full bios on, on each of these uh, persons uh, on the website, but I uh, want to at least give some highlights. First, we have uh, Janet Stricker, who is the relationship manager of US cities at BP. BP was a leader in the National Patrol Council work on CCUS. And Janet is currently leading BP's work with the city of Houston on the Houston Climate Action Plan. We'll bring that unique lens to this discussion. We have Duho Liponen, who is coordinator of the Clean Energy Ministerial CCUS Initiative. Now, this is an initiative with 12 member governments who have joined together to accelerate CCUS. He will bring a global perspective to our discussion uh, and, and uh, connect what's going on with the rest of the world to Houston. We have Nigel Denby, is global head of carbon management at Gaffney Klein Associates. He played a huge role in the National Petroleum Council work in CCUS. And as the students mentioned, was provided some of the vital thinking that underpinned the work the students presented, particularly on the economic model. Nigel brings a deep technical and economic and regulatory perspective on CCUS globally in the US uh, and for Houston. And finally, we have uh, Chuck McConnell, who, as you know, leads the University of Houston Center for Carbon Management and Energy and really has been the core uh, driver and leader for the work that we just reviewed and this uh, event today. 
So uh, with that introduction, let me just hand over to the panelists to, to give a short perspective, get a start, and then we can open up, it up for uh, Q&A. Maybe I could ask Judge Janet if you could uh, start us off. Thanks, Scott. Happy to. I um, I have to, to say that seeing uh, a group of students do actual in-depth research using a report that we spent um, you know, roughly two and a half years pulling together and going out and talking about was super exciting for me. So, um, you know, spending uh, the better part of two years developing um, with a broad range of participants, uh, the NPC study on carbon capture use and storage um, was, was a fantastic experience for me. But even better than that was seeing a group of students who could take what we were hoping to develop, which was a roadmap, and, and be able to use it at a local level and say, this is how this could play out in reality. So um, kudos to the students and to you, Chuck, for, for all that work. I think it's, a, a, it's so fantastic to see, and, and I just I enjoyed watching it. I think um, just two thoughts from me as we get started. Um, over the last several years working on the MPC study and then um, trying to get the word out about the study after it was launched in December of last year, um, I think two things have really become abundantly clear to me. The first is that I think folks are pretty well aligned on the fact that we need to do something to address the dual challenge of continuing to provide energy to the world while ad addressing emissions and the risks of climate change. So I think regardless of what industry you're in, where you are in the world, um, we're all pretty much in alignment on that view. And then I think the second big thing for me is recognizing that it's going to take a lot of different groups of people and industries and governments and universities working together to make this move forward. Um, in the MPC study, we had participants from over 300 different organizations um, contributing to the study. And, and I think the same holds true as we start to think about how to do this going forward. It takes everyone coming together um, in order to, to find ways to implement this and partner together to make it happen. So um, I think that comes through in, in the work that the students have done. I think it continues to come through in the study. And um, I'm excited to, to be here and talk about it today. Jana, thank you much for that. Uh, maybe we can go to uh, Iho. Could you uh, go next? Sure. Thank you. Uh, it would be would be my pleasure. So, uh, uh, hello everyone. I am Juho Lipponen. I run and coordinate the Clean Energy Ministerial CCUS initiative, which is a mouthful, but it's all in the name. Um, Clean Energy Ministerial is a group of uh, currently 28 countries all across the globe, uh, three quarters of, um, of global energy related CO2 emissions, but also 90% of, uh, of clean energy investments. So it really is a relevant group of, uh, of countries. And uh, as Scott already mentioned, uh, the CCUS group under this construct uh, has 12 members. And these are all lead countries on, on CCUS in the world. And uh, um, and, and Jane mentioned this, um, <clears throat> the fact that we need various groups to come together to collaborate. Uh, and in a way, our group is on global level, uh, just one of those forums. We try to provide a framework and, and a platform for governments, uh, for industry, but also for the finance sector, very importantly, to, uh, uh, to jointly think how we can accelerate CCUS. Um, <clears throat> I'm also really, uh, you know, excited and pleased to see that uh, this work, uh, you know, was was done by uh, by the students. And maybe it's not even over. Maybe you're continuing this. But uh, the point is that we've seen a lot of global and national roadmaps. But at the end of the day, these sorts of roadmaps and plans need to come to the local level where action happens and where industries are and where where the uh, uh, where CCUS can, you know, bring its contribution and um, and CCUS just happens to require a lot of planning. Uh, I don't think we can get around that. So, um, so it's really great that this work has been done, and great that it's been done by by interested students. This is uh, this is this is brilliant, but it's also important. I think that the area where Houston is and uh, the way Houston's energy 
leadership is is um, is today constructed will require CCUS. This is an important thing. This is a lifeline for for the future. So kudos really on, on doing this work and uh, and uh, we'll continue discussion. Thanks. Good. Thanks for that. Maybe Nigel, uh, you can go next. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Scott. Thanks, Chuck. Um, and, um, and definitely thanks to the, the students. Uh, everybody's, uh, of course, recognizing the great work uh, that they've done. Um, of course, um, um, Scott mentioned uh, the National Petroleum Council uh, study formed some of the basis. And, and of course, we're moving from national now down to, to really local level implementation. The study title was about addressing the dual challenge the dual challenge of providing affordable reliable energy to meet the world's growing demand whilst also addressing the risk of climate change and if there's there isn't really anywhere else better in the world that that can actually do that provide energy to the rest of the world at scale and also needs to combat the risks of climate change and that's really the houston and the gulf coast area there's some fundamental changes, I think, going on in, in CCUS recently. It's not just a technology for fossil fuels. Uh, it's not just a technology for power generation, as we've seen from the students' work. It's a versatile, low-carbon energy technology that, that really is on the brink of moving from demonstration to deployment. It's commercially available, and one project can deliver large-scale reductions in emissions. So there's about 20 projects across the world today. Um, and uh, we've got several here in the greater Houston uh, area. Um, um, in construction, in advanced development, in early development, and there's 39 pilot and demonstration CCS facilities, nine CCS technology centers globally. So um, it really is a technology that's on this brink of moving into deployment. Now, the U.S. is already, yeah, has over 80% of the world's installed CCUS ca uh, capacity. It's benefited from consistent congressional support. So far, about $5 billion been invested over the last two decades. And of course, that's enabled the, uh, the Department of Energy um, to lead and support public-private collaboration on science technology, the Environmental Protection Agency to establish comprehensive regulatory framework, and the Internal Revenue Service, you've heard it from Brad earlier on, establishing this world-leading policy support with the 45Q tax credit. The, so the U.S. is definitely a leader, world leader in CCUS, uniquely positioned to deploy the technologies at scale. And I would say, so is Houston. Thanks, Nigel. So, yeah. We'll, we'll get back to more, lots of unpacking that opening. So we'll be coming back to that in a moment. But maybe we can move to Chuck and just let you uh, add a few uh, words of wisdom to, to add to our uh, discussion. Well, I don't know how much wisdom, Scott, but, but thank you for the opportunity. And I'll be brief because I want to get to this discussion. I don't want to go any further without saying one more time, thank you, Nigel, and thank you, Gaffney Klein. Uh, were it not for your strong support from the get-go in terms of the cost modeling and the fundamental structure around the economic model, uh, we would have had a hard start. And you, uh, you gave us the fuel to jumpstart the whole thing. So thank you uh, again from, from all of us. Uh, the best quote I've ever heard is, it's about the emissions, not the fuel. That's what we focused on. It's the emissions. And so I think that's the, the real heart of all of this is we're trying to make a real impact on emissions. And, and focusing on fuels is the wrong strategy. It's the wrong thing to think about in terms of making an impact. So again, going back to that fundamental, that's what underpinned a lot of our research. Let's get those emissions and let's get at them as soon as we can. The second thing is during the rest of this month, you're gonna hear a number of other symposiums about other key energy transition activities that are going on. The hydrogen economy, the grid of the future and integrating renewables. And I believe one of the observations that I can make here, Scott, is that through this research and working with those other teams, it's become abundantly clear to me 
that none of those other things can actually happen without CCUS. If you're going to go from gray to blue hydrogen, you need CCUS. And if you're going to have a hydrogen economy, you've got to have that underpinning capability. If you want to have a grid of the future where you've got reliable, dependable energy, sure, you're going to have a lot of renewables, but you better have baseload electrons that are decarbonized. And that's the fundamentals that CCUS brings. And so again, it's, it's really about enabling the energy transition, not hanging on to the past. And I'll say one last thing, what we've also learned here are the global implications of what's going on here in terms of our workforce development, our industries and our state, and frankly, the US generally across the US Gulf Coast in terms of the implications of this. Is it a roadmap for the future? I think it is. Is it something that the rest of the world will be able to draw from, not just intellectually, but also from a business standpoint and understanding the fundamentals of how this all comes together? We have a responsibility, I think, to the rest of the world to make it work here. We've got the companies here that are excited about it, and they're the ones that are going to be driving it, but we need to provide the rest of that community support to make this happen. Thank you, Chuck. Again, a lot in there to, to unpack and we'll come back to some of these issues. And uh, just looking at uh, some of the questions coming in and also some of the topics raised in the uh, introductory discussion, I think a good place to start is around this theme of the, what does it take in terms of regulatory incentive wise to, to make this happen. And of course, 45Q, has been a big part of this, you know, the view on the oil economics for enhanced recovery is part of this. But Nigel, I know you have a unique perspective, you having seen it across the US, the National Petroleum Council, and of course, you know, some of the good economics that you provide to the team here. From your vantage point, you know, what are the key regulatory hurdles, tax incentive that we need to overcome to make all this reality? So, so definitely the most progressive um, policy support for CCS worldwide today is 45Q. Let's just, uh, you know, have that as the, the baseline. Um, nothing is as clear, um, you know, globally. There's other policies for low carbon energy technologies, but, um, but nothing is clear for CCS in terms of sector specific, technology specific deployment. Of uh, of CCUS um, than we have here federally from uh, from the U.S. government, uh, Congress, and uh, implemented through the IRS. So, it's a market based policy for CCUS deployment. It's not limited in um, volume, um, and it sets a price um, that uh, that can be incorporated into uh, into project uh, economics, of course. You don't have that clarity um, elsewhere with many other policies and those other policies are usually limited in terms of the 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 amount of money and uh, therefore the amount of projects um, that uh, that can be implemented so here we've got a market-based uh, um, system really with uh, with 45q but there are some other um, so 45q is a production tax credit of course, $35 a ton for EOR utilization and $50 a ton of CO2 for, uh, for if the CO2 is stored in a, in a saline aquifer. Um, so, um, so there are, it's a production tax credit. Once you invest and once you start up the, uh, the operation, um, then you can claim the tech, the tax credit on an annual basis, of course. Um, now, that really, of course, helps with project financing, but of course, there's a lot, a third of the cost, total cost um, of a CCS project really is, uh, is upfront capital requirement um, uh, in terms of the, uh, the equipment for capture. We heard from, uh, from the students, Mac Powell, uh, on the cost of capture. Um, and of course, that then needs really an investment tax credit. An investment tax credit there is one. Um, there's a section 48 in the tax code as well that really has also underpinned 
wind and solar deployment, of course, here in the uh, the US. So both this combination of a production tax credit to help the operation with its operating costs, an investment tax credit to help uh, CCUS deployment with the, its investment capital costs. Then the other thing that really underpins deployment is really basically standards and mandates. And again, wind and solar have had with standards and mandates for for deployment through regional application, um, really to make sure then that a certain amount of implementation uh, implementation happens. So those are some of the other types of approaches that have been used for other low carbon energy technologies that people are thinking about could be applied to CCUS. But there's also not forget financing costs. Financing costs, we've got a great financing center here in Houston as well. Um, and, uh, and financing costs also can be a good chunk of the, uh, the total project costs. And so reducing the cost of finance because these projects are capture, transport and storage and have multiple players along the supply chain, addressing the financing costs and the risk of financing and reducing that risk through really underpinning policies like loan guarantees. There is a loan guarantee for CCUS from the federal government as well, really can help get low cost capital um, deployed into these projects as well. So there's a lot of things, combination of things really that, that are required in order to, uh, to, be, to develop a successful CCUS project. Let me just ask one follow on question and then if any other panelists wanna pile on, we can go there as well. But if you think about a, a project that you were working on with one of your clients um, and they ended up you know, not going ahead you know, what were the kind of the big issues uh, that really uh, kind of got in the way? Uh, you know, and just even responding to some of the questions that are coming up, you know, this does seem to be, uh, you know, an investment type that requires quite a lot of government support. Uh, but, and there's quite a bit of risk around oil price risk, as the students point out, enhanced oil recovery risk along the way. But as you've dived into some of these projects, you know, what, what have held back companies from going forward? So it's a great question. Um, I would say today, um, so yeah, I've worked in CCUS projects since 2004 around the world. Um, I'm a petroleum engineer by background um, and um, have, um, I would say, unfortunately, most of the projects that I have worked on have not been successful, but we've learned a lot. So I'd say transferring of those learnings um, to projects today is really, really important. So we don't make mistakes of our past. Um, and um, I would say one of some of the key issues are, of course, bringing together a collaborative group that can actually undertake the supply chain um, of a CCS project. So an emitter of a CO2 emissions may not have the capabilities, of course, uh, to, uh, to deploy CCS. They need a CO2 capture technology provider. They need a transportation solution. And they also then need, of course, a subsurface um, capability, pore space in order to do that. So it really is around bringing together um, really different parts of the supply chain, different companies, different skill sets in order to deliver these projects. So it really goes to the, the first formulation of the projects. Um, and does a company have the right, uh, the right um, different components in order to be, uh, to be successful? Um, once they have those, I think uh, really, um, yeah, they have the main attributes, I think, uh, to, uh, to then move forward uh, um, successfully. Maybe we could uh, get Juho into this conversation and uh, just ask a kind of a specific question. I know you've been close to uh, what's been going on in Rotterdam, Netherlands, as they began to think through what kind of incentives are needed to make this happen. Maybe you could describe a little bit what's going on there and kind of in contrast to Houston and, and give us some uh, uh, of that perspective. Sure, thanks. Um, uh, and if, if you if you allow, I mean, I can I can preface all, all that by saying a few words about, um, about let's say, the rest of the world, because, uh, uh, I mean, I, I agree fully with what 
has been said earlier that um, that the U.S. is in the lead position uh, by by far in in CCUS today, but luckily there is action elsewhere as well, and. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you know, I think something like 30 new projects have been announced since 2017 in in the U.S., but also Europe, Middle East, uh, and, and and elsewhere. So uh, it, it, there is a there is movement, which is which is great. Um, now, uh, going going then to to uh, Europe and um, and perhaps Rotterdam, which is an interesting example uh, uh, in this part of the world because there's certain aspects there that are similar, I think, to uh, to the uh, uh, Houston case. Um, <clears throat> so what do we have there? There's a uh, uh, there's a there's an idea and there's a project to start capturing CO2 from the Rotterdam Harbor, Rotterdam port area from various industrial sources, and do it for the period of uh, of um, 15 years or, or or more, as soon as as soon as possible. And um, and and Rotterdam is is uh, the largest emission area in the Netherlands and obviously one of the very largest ones in Europe as well. So it's, it is a large, uh, large um, uh, emission base, if you if you like, concentrated in, uh, in a rather, rather small area. And what's going on there, I think, I would say, and what's what's contributed to, uh, to um, Rotterdam moving ahead and happening uh, I think first is, is um, there's been a kind of a societal call for that. There's a government policy to cut emissions by 95 percent uh, in 2050, and there's also uh, the, the Rotterdam city and port area that have have established that we need to reduce our emissions in this area uh, dramatically. Um, secondly, I think uh, what's interesting uh, and very beneficial there is that there's a there's a clear lead. There is a there's the Port of Rotterdam Authority, Garsuni, and another third company, EBN. But there's a, there's a lead consortium that has taken this on board and has started to run with it. And I think that's a really important thing. Without, without a lead like this, I think it, this would not have happened. Then, of course, there's expertise. There's a, there's a lot of industrial companies in the, uh, in that, uh, uh, in the port area. Uh, and four have now signed a deal or, or signed a, uh, an agreement with, uh, with the project to, to actually investigate and go forward with, uh, with capture plants on their, uh, at their facilities. So there is a, there is a start of the, uh, of the capture, capture uh, base there. Fourthly, there's incentives. Um, the European Union uh, is about to, uh, to award this project 100 million euro from a European um, uh, funding facility. Which of course is 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 great. This is um, mostly directed to the uh, uh, infrastructure and to the pipeline, so that the pipeline can be large enough for a lot of different emitters in the in the future. And then there's also an operational support. This goes back to what Nigel was saying that you need both sort of investment and operational side. Uh, there is a, a Dutch operational uh, support system which is being uh, the details of which is you know have been and are being. Uh, are being ready now and should be, uh, and that should be open for applications by the end of the year, uh, which will then allow all these capture companies to actually uh, prepare their projects uh, and 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 bid in that system. And then, of course, physically, there is infrastructure, and that has maybe two sub points. There's availability of of storage close to the shore in in uh, depleting gas fields. And then this joint infrastructure approach that the project is all about, that will enable a lot of different uh, projects to, to hook up uh, to it. So there's a lot of things that are, are you know, aligned uh, in this area and which is, which is great. Um, otherwise, there's also other ports in, in, in the vicinity, Antwerp uh, in, uh, in Belgium, Le Havre in, uh, in France. And also you could look at the, uh, some of the UK uh, clusters and hubs also uh, uh, around ports, even if they're not so well known. But I think it's uh, it's also uh, uh, something that is quite characteristic at the moment, and, and which is the right way to go, which is uh, which is uh, developing CCUS hubs, which is also the the Houston uh, work that 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 you're doing. 
very helpful, <clears throat> a lot of pieces to that, but it, it does raise this one big issue around uh, how, you know, uh, the Netherlands and Rotterdam in particular have, have organized themselves to pursue this in, in a kind of pretty coordinated way. And, and maybe that's a good, uh, you know, lead in to, to you know, to, to ask the question around uh, what is the city of Houston and the climate action plan and how that might contribute. And maybe Janet, you could uh, uh, take the ball from there and, and help us uh, understand how all those pieces might contribute to Houston getting a coordinated response. Sure, thanks Scott. I, I think um, Houston launched in, in the spring um, their climate action plan and, uh, and BP just recently uh, entered into a four-year agreement to support the city of Houston in executing that, that climate action plan. And that's the role that I'm taking on um, in supporting the city in that. And so I think uh, we'll be serving as strategic partner and technical advisor to the city as they develop their plans. But I thought one of the most interesting elements of their climate action plan and um, in, in, in recognition that Houston is uh, the energy capital of the world, is the role of CCUS and energy innovation in their climate action plan and to, and to ensure that, that Houston is the world leader in CCUS technology development and deployment. And I think, um, you know, to Yuho's point about the, the, the role of ports in this opportunity, um, Houston recognizes that there is a great opportunity uh, in the port of Houston to leverage what we've got here. And you saw it in the maps that the students showed in their presentation. We've got the industries, we've got the pipeline capability here, we've got the storage capacity here in this region. Um, it really does become that perfect location to start to see how you build these industrial clusters of activity. And I know for, for us at BP, that's a big element of our strategy is looking at how can we create these industrial hubs and decarbonize these industrial areas. Um, because again, um, to, the, to the IEA report, these emissions are hard to reach through any other means. Um, and so if we can find ways to bring together the industry participants, the pipeline industry, um, the uh, oil and gas industry, uh, the energy innovation companies, Houston becomes that perfect location to start to see how this um, all comes together and, and, and how it becomes a successful business moving forward. And so I think, um, you know, there's a lot of really great opportunity and a lot of things coming together at just the right time uh, as we think about how Houston gets to net zero by 2050, which is a super ambitious goal. Um, but again, it's, it's one that folks are aligned needs to happen. Hey, Jane, could I just jump in on your comment a bit? Because the, the other thing that, I, that strikes me about this is you mentioned Houston being a center and being recognized globally. And, and it's great that we're doing things in Rotterdam and we tend to get focused in our own world. But, you know, there's a lot of big activity in Shanghai and Jakarta and, and places in the world where this technology is so fundamentally important to really moving the needle in terms of international emissions in total. And, and I'm sure that's not lost on everybody as well in terms of the ability to take this globally and have it be part of, if you will, our export strategy. Absolutely, Chuck. I think, and in the NPC study, we really talked about what is, you know, the US has a unique role to play in exporting this capability and in our technology development and being the world leader in how do you get that technology developed and get everybody else in the world using it. And, um, and, and again, creating and maintaining those highly skilled jobs in the US for us to be able to develop and deploy and, and expand that reach across the world. I think, I think there's huge opportunity. You know, one of the things that I, I saw in listening to the students' work, which you know, very much fits with the uh, U.S. Uh, and Houston kind of very entrepreneurial model, was you, you could almost envision individual uh, companies uh, looking at this work and saying, "Ah, I all I need to do is is find a bit of uh, hydrogen 
production from my refinery and I got some CO2. Uh, I just need to call up that Denver pipeline and put it there and then find a friend of mine in the EMP industry to do a deal on uh, enhanced oil recovery. I mean, there was a sense that, you know, the great kind of Texas entrepreneurs, you know, could make this happen. And this is a little bit in contrast to what Yuho was saying was, was you know, kind of a coordinating body led by Gastroni and industry players kind of orchestrating this. And I don't know if, to what extent though, you or any of the panelists have thought about, is this a model that we can just let the raw entrepreneurs of Texas take it on and make it happen? Or is there a role for uh, coordination? Maybe it's different in, in different phases, but uh, any, any thoughts on that? Well, well, my take on it, Scott, is it's a little of both. I, I don't think that we're going to be in for a pure play on government subsidies and, and a fundamental pipeline system that's sort of owned by the government. I, that doesn't feel like Texas to me, okay? I also believe that there's too much to put on the shoulders of the entrepreneurs, if you will, to make this happen. There needs to be structure and support. So I believe that's a little of both. I agree. Yeah, uh, I think, you know, starting off with the the, the um, entrepreneurs uh, here in, in Texas, uh, but at least collaborating together, let's mm -hmm. say, you know, so because then when they come together, they can actually share and reduce costs in some of the infrastructure requirements. Of course, yes, we have a pipeline, but uh, but certainly in the storage location um, as well off the Denbury pipeline. Um, and then looking at perhaps, uh, you know, uh, you know, combined capture facility as well. So much of this industry is right next to each other, of course, uh, along the Houston ship channel. So I think there is an opportunity for collaboration in the entrepreneurial ship that uh, Texas is, is renowned for in order to do things at lower cost at the start as well. Yeah, it seems to me just building on you know, when Nigel Chuck were saying, just to even put a, a, some specificity on it, we are going to need to create some collaborating mechanism. Uh, in, in form, we, we ought to be thinking about how we can you know, orchestrate that a bit. And then I think there is a, a difference on Chuck's point of, of you know, the starting point where we have the existing pipeline. And then when you get into the phases down the road, where we're going to build big pipelines. We're going to need, someone's going to have to do that other than the entrepreneurs, if I understand what Chuck is saying right now. Well, you know, Scott, and really just to I'll maybe put a signature point on this, uh, this whole commercialization difficulty, sh sh the, the challenges of it, has been recognized by the Department of Energy, has been recognized by the Southern States Energy Board and, and many of the companies that are, I'm sure, listening today. And, and the Department of Energy, through the SSEB, recently recognized the university in, in, at Houston and our Center for Carbon Management as a place where a commercialization consortia can exist. Uh, and so putting that stick in the ground, understanding everything you're saying in terms of not just technology and engineering, but policy, business support, all the legal frameworks, et cetera. Um, we're excited about that because it's another place where people can come together, know they're doing right things in the right place. And that's what we want to provide for that. Yeah. And there, there's one more thing I'll say is, you know, there's really one reason why the U.S. is the world leader in CCUS today with 80% of all capacity. And it's because of the entrepreneurial ship um, of the companies that have implemented those projects today, not being solely reliant on governmental policy. You know, and and it's key, of course, you cannot rely. You only get one or two projects if you just rely on policy. You need this ecosystem of competition, collaboration, in really in order to uh, to to do things at the lowest cost um, and uh, and to really then get scale. So um, it really is, as I think Chuck and, you, and, and Scott, you're saying, you know, it really is a, a combined um, approach that's required. Maybe also, if I can come in here, the uh, uh, it, it, I think this discussion also reflects a little bit the difference between how things have gone so far, like, you know, in, in the US, in, in Texas, um, both, or, you know, Permian Basin, you've had EOR opportunity, there's been somewhat more opportunity for the uh, for the sort of business-led uh, 
project development. We've had really none of that in, in Europe. And that's why perhaps, um, and it's always been much more concentrated on, on how do we store something that we don't want. And for that, you need policy and you need planning. So there's a bit of a different tradition also. Um, and I guess it really is horses for, for courses. And uh, if it works well in some setting in some country, go for it. Yeah. There, there's been a few questions coming in uh, just around the, the nature of government support. You know, what happens with 45Q when it ends? Um, and then you, you just mentioned the notion of you know, the implication of uh, some sustained government support uh, going forward, particularly on the storage and liability side. And maybe just frame the question this way is, is, is when the NPC report was going on and people were thinking about the various phases and, and then as you translated that into Houston, uh, you know, what was in the minds of, uh, of the authors of that work in terms of what the long-term type of government support would be? It, I'll frame it this way, which is, do we think the economics will just get better and the support will, will just cease, or are we going to need some continued support down the road? I think that's some of the questions we're getting in from the audience. I think now that you're a good one to, to jump on that one. So, Okay, so yeah, I'll start then. Here is the, the report, the, the lovely report, you know, and Jane, you know, we should have had Houston on the, the, the picture here on the cover, really. Uh, but I tried, the, I tried. Here's, here's the report available electronically on the NPC, uh, NPC website. Um, you'll be able to see, and there's a lot of detail about Indeed, uh, Scott, you know, and the, the audience's questions. There's a lot of detail about this pathway around policy support going from, just like the, the students and Chuck have mapped out for Houston, an activation phase, expansion phase, and then an at-scale deployment phase. To cut to the chase, the at-scale deployment phase, achieving that level of um, uh, reduction. So basically about uh, a fifth of emission, or all emissions from stationary sources here in the United States. So 500 million tons per annum of, of CO2 reduction across the United States in the next 25 years. Now that would be required to be really underpinned by national policies to address climate change. But you know, Nigel, to be fair to that, the other thing that you did not do was yeah. assume magical thinking around technology development, yeah. which oftentimes comes into these conversations in yeah. other areas where we're gonna assume so much more storage or we're gonna assume these magical things are gonna happen technically. You took a position where existing technology going forward and how would that happen? So I would look yeah. at that maybe as a pessimistic case in that yeah. regard with a lot of upside, is that fair? So we, we indeed took a case that uh, assumes current technology. We then said, well, the impact of technology can be significant. It's been significant and we've never stayed still, of course, uh, in the oil and gas industry, wind and solar, of course, have achieved 80, 90% cost reduction. So we did then take a position around the cost reduction potential of technology, which underpinned our recommendation around the importance of continued technology advancement from both a public-private standpoint, um, and that though it would require substantial increase in investment over the next 10 years to kickstart that. So moving from, and the US also has the world's greatest amount of R&D support through the DOE from, uh, from Congress, about $200 million a year going into R&D, &D, research development, demonstration projects for CCS specifically. And uh, really we, we were calling for a 5X on that annual spend in order to achieve the cost reductions. But once you do that cost reduction potential and look at it from a total, what would it deliver? It was a tenfold return on that investment mm. in terms of cost reduction impact. So yes, you are right. We started off with a somewhat conservative viewpoint of what we know, 
but that then underpinned our recommendation around technology investment and its critical nature to reduce cost. Maybe, Juho, you might even comment with a kind of a global lens on when you look around the world at, um, you know, where technology is being developed uh, and, and how they're looking to the U.S. and Houston in particular uh, on those areas. Any observations on what are other kind of uh, places in the world where there is some real leadership on carbon capture storage or carbon capture use and storage or technology development? Good question. Um, <clears throat> I think you, you, you're looking at countries like um, Norway uh, with a long, long tradition on, on CO2 uh, capture and injection. Uh, their um, uh, their test, test center in Mongstadt and, and a strong uh, uh, R&D program as well. Uh, I'd say that's, that's a key one and several you know, solutions have come from, uh, from Norway and the and the Monster Center has been has been serving a lot of uh, technology providers to to really refine their their product before it can go and be commercialized, which is different, I think, from the uh, National Center in the U.S., which is a you know I would say a step lower in TRL. Um, uh, the U.K. also has a strong uh, uh, tradition. I would say it's a little bit more academic than than Norway, and then. Uh, uh, China, our, our colleagues in China in uh, academia, uh, aided strongly by the Ministry of Science and Technology, uh, and and then their strong industry, especially in the power side, um, the Huanangs and Shenhuas of the world have been have been at this for 15 years. So there are others uh, around the world who are also looking at technology now. Uh, how that exactly compares with Houston, I don't, I don't, I don't know. But there is a, there, there are other data points uh, out there which I think are useful. Yeah, so I think our mindset needs to be is that you know we we have uh, uh, programs in place at the U.S. level for technology, and uh, Houston has a, a great opportunity to to get started in this thing. But there are competitors. We, this is this is maybe ours to, to lose, but but if we sit on our hands, we won't make it happen. So you know, we need to kind of jump in and, and grab it and, uh, and and take it forward. You know, Scott, I, I maybe make a plug also for our students. I mean, I'm sure it's not lost on everyone that two of our three students are female. The diversity of the interest in this, the, the youth, of the interest in this, I think is remarkable in terms of the workforce of the future. And, and to be able to have that kind of enthusiasm coming through, not just here in Houston, but if you think about this globally, those students in China or those in the Middle East or others in Europe, I, I think that's kind of a, it's kind of a remarkable transition to say, I mean, young people are, you know, they wanna change the world and they wanna make an impact. What a better thing to work on than CCUS. And I'll jump in on that as well. I'll just say with our firm McKinsey, uh, we have a, a large group of young people who are very passionate about this topic. And the, the leader of this area for, in our firm is a woman. And there are more women than men that are working on this topic. So this is, this is an area that uh, is gender neutral at a minimum and uh, getting a lot of passion from young people uh, and, uh, and women in particular. I, I want to just ask a, a question of, 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 you know, Jana, just putting your kind of BP hat on as you, you know, look at uh, CCUS in the, in the overall BP portfolio, technology development related to CSS in, in BP, and even projects uh, around the world uh, that BP is kind of looking at. Any framing on how a, a large company, just using BP as an example, kind of looks at uh, CCUS and Houston? Yes, Scott, thanks. I think um, it, our new strategy that we announced earlier this year is a, a net zero by 2050 strategy. And we absolutely see uh, CCUS as having a key role. Um, it is actually a key division within our new low carbon businesses. And so, um, you know, it's always been part of our sciences and technology and engineering um, business within the organization and it's been elevated now as part of our 
uh, one of our low carbon businesses. And I think we see CCUS as being critical to our uh, hydrogen strategy um, and to decarbonizing not only our operations, but others' operations as well. I mean, our, one of our aims is not only to reduce our emissions and get us to net zero, but to help the world get to net zero. And so for us, CCUS is critical in helping to achieve that strategy by helping, um, particularly in the industrial sectors. And when you look at projects like Net Zero Teesside in the UK, you know, that's really all about taking that industrial hub and figuring out how to make it net zero. And CCUS will play a critical element in that. And we continue to look for opportunities across the US um, and in our role as part of OGCI um, to, to identify those places around the world where we can um, leverage our skill set, our capability, and our experience with NBP to help drive CCUS deployment globally. You all, maybe um, uh, as we get near the, the end here, just to ask for your thoughts as you reflect on the conversation we had, <clears throat> taking your global lens on, you know. What, what are your views on the opportunities for CCUS in Houston and globally, and, and uh, what takeaways would you have from this conversation? Well, I think it's, uh, I mean, the, I would say the main, main really positive takeaway is the, is the fact that the university and the students have been interested in, in doing this sort of, should we say, a local, local roadmap for CCUS. I think that's really what we have to do in various parts of the uh, of, the, of the world, and, and I think that's really extremely helpful. Um, uh, I think that maybe the key point that I've been thinking about and also working on the past um, year to eighteen months mostly is that it's this idea that the, you know getting CCUS going is a is a three legged stool in in many ways, um, and, and no single operator can do it alone. Uh, so we need in most cases, still some form of government support, not necessarily always economic support, but we need the governments to be on board and to tell that, yeah, we need this and we want this. Uh, obviously, industry uh, needs to be there to, you know, take take risk, but also then to uh, to bring their expertise. And uh, and obviously, oil and gas industry is in a, in a, in a critical position here because of the uh, subsurface knowledge and uh, the pipeline uh, knowledge um, knowledge how to how to move and, and inject fluids that's that's critical and then uh, the third leg the finance sector that has not been in this discussion enough I think recently mm -hmm. and I think that's perhaps the a group that that everybody should be activating their discussions with and uh, if that's something that can you know fit your work program going forward I think that would be a great great thing to uh, uh, great thing to do that's a very good point. You know, yeah. we, have, we hear about all this vast new ESG capital coming in. We need to get some of it directed to CCUS. You know, very, very good uh, insight to add. May I say one more thing? Yeah. Which is that, um, and this is really directed to the to the students mostly. I mean, um, and, and I, I, I suppose to us to us all is that you know, there's always going to be enough of people who say and who tell us that this this is not worth anything. That you know that this is about energy. Going back to what Chuck was saying at the beginning, that you know it's not about emissions, but uh, not about energy, but about emissions. And there's going to be a lot of people who say, "Well, no, I don't agree. I think this is about energy and moving away from something old to something, something new." But I think now it's not the time to get discouraged. You know, we we need CCUS. That's absolutely clear. So, uh, so, so listen to those folks, but uh, but keep on this road because this is really important. Thanks for that. Jana, any, any observations from your point of view? Yeah, I think um, I, I would echo Yuho's statement about staying positive and, and not giving up on this technology and about this path, because I do think that there are lots of challenges. Um, but, I, but I do think that continuing to push forward, continuing to build the case for why it matters um, and how impactful it can be, and really focusing on those places that you can't get to the emissions otherwise um, as the starting point for really driving that opportunity. 
um, and, and really getting people to understand the critical role that this plays in not only helping reduce emissions, but helping us transition our economy to a clean energy economy. Um, and, and creating opportunities for job and investment. And, and just, um, you know, when I started working on the NPC study on CCUS, I didn't know what CCUS was. Um, and, and now I spend the better part of my time talking about it to anyone who's willing to listen to me talk about it. So you can convince people, you can teach people, um, but just keep having the conversations and, and keep driving uh, people to understand what, you know, what this technology can do for us uh, in terms of addressing climate and in terms of creating a new economy. Yeah, and uh, again, thanks again for your leadership with the Houston Climate Action Plan. I think that'll provide a great platform to connect the overall strategy for Houston to uh, CCUS. So we look forward to your leadership on that. Nigel, yeah, again, you have such a unique uh, perch in, in, in this from being close to the specific projects and then with your long history of failed projects you highlighted before, <laughs> or, you know, knowing what it takes to really make this happen. Then the fantastic work you've done at NPC and with the students here. Uh, listen to this conversation, you know, what, what observations, thoughts you would have to, to offer. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, so definitely um, have learned a uh, learned a lot. That's uh, that's science and engineering right there. Um, as long as we uh, we learn from that and move on and and do it better next time. So um, so yeah. I I think um, you know fundamentals. Let's get it get get it down to fundamentals. You know, Houston has the the you know the infrastructure. It both uh, both man made infrastructure and natural infrastructure in terms of geology. It's right underneath our feet. Uh, we have the technology capability. Um, we have the finance industry here for energy. Um, and we have the people capability, that's for sure, in order to, uh, to do this. So, um, you know, with all of those fundamentals, I really do believe that, that CCUS is Houston's next moon landing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, very good point. And I would just add that, you know, with, when we think about from a Houston economic development point of view, you know, we just finished a, a massive wave investment in petrochemicals uh, at the moment, you know, the offshore uh, E&P side and uh, unconventional E&P side, we'll just say is a little bit on its back, <laughs> not a lot of the growth in those areas. This from a pure selfish point of view of the greater Houston area could be a, a major boost in terms of capital spend to drive a wave of economic development. And, and I would just add that to what you just said, that with all the capabilities we have, this could be a, a huge boost. But maybe could hand it to Chuck just to spend a you know, few minutes here wrapping it all together before we hand off to, uh, to Ramanan for his close. Yeah, I, well, I don't want to attempt to I don't want to attempt to shed light where there's no darkness. There's been a lot of great discussion here today, so I, I won't go down that road. But let me say one thing, because I have burned a few calories myself in Washington, and I understand sometimes how politics get in the way of things. And we've talked about government support, and it isn't just funding. It's actually a, a willingness, a drive, a desire to move forward. And I can't think of anything more apolitical than CCUS. I don't care where you sit in the conversation in terms of economic development or climate change or emissions controls or all the things we talk about. It's not politics, it's common sense. And frankly, we need to get to that kind of conversation, bring it forward in the political settings that can create ways to bring people together rather than arguing with each other. And I think the city of Houston has that opportunity, certainly, and not only for ourselves, but for the rest of the world. And, and I, I, frankly, from my perspective, I can't see it any other way. And, uh, and I, that's why this is so exciting to me in terms of how we're moving forward and all the enthusiasm in the marketplace, Scott. Yeah, very good. Well, I'll, I'll just say, uh, 
something that easier for an outsider to say just you know how important a role the the University of Houston will play and the Center for Carbon Management Energy will play in really being a forum to to encourage collaboration amongst the players, uh, taking leadership on an issue like this to drive the thinking. This is a huge step forward in thinking just to, to help our community, a massive gift. We moved away from hand waving to through this great work of the students and to here is a practical way forward, hugely valuable to our community. So I want to thank you for that and, and uh, hope that you uh, will continue to, to, to drive this going, going forward. So, so, so thanks for that. Maybe um, we could, uh, uh, unless anyone else has anything we want to pile on, uh, we could hand over to, to Ramadan to have him uh, provide some uh, closing comments. Well, Scott, thank you so very much for uh, this wonderful uh, symposium, this great discussion. Um, really appreciated all the different angles that we heard from. Uh, to the three students, Brad, Maka, Patty, thank you so much for your hard work putting this together and really um, setting a baseline for not only this study, but for all the other studies that come in the following weeks. And, and this is really uh, a great starting point for a, a good discussion about how Houston could start to lead in this area. Uh, Jane, um, you, uh, Nigel, Chuck, thank you. Uh, a great discussion, uh, really appreciated all the viewpoints. Uh, and, uh, and Chuck, thanks so much for uh, taking up that issue of diversity. I think you know when it is really critical that we address the workforce side of things and advance this conversation where we've always focused on technology, we've always focused on policy, but perhaps the most important part of this are the people. And, and I think uh, really taking that on and getting to for us to understand that this is gonna be driven by uh, a diverse group of young minds that wanna solve global challenges is really important. Uh, I want to thank our partners, uh, both from the Center for Houston's Future, as well as uh, the Gutierrez Energy Management Institute uh, for their support in doing this work, but also in promoting and uh, getting the word out. Uh, a lot of the material uh, from the report, uh, the 12 page report, as well as the slides that go into the conversation are available on our website. Um, www.uh.edu slash energy. Uh, please do look at that site uh, for all the reports there. Um, I wanna thank our partners uh, at uh, the Texas Industrial Energy Efficiency Program uh, for uh, promoting this event to a pretty broad audience. Uh, lastly, before I let you go, I wanna remind you next Friday, same place, same time, uh, 10, uh, 10 a.m., uh, October 16th, uh, the low carbon electric grid. Um, this is gonna be our next part of how Houston becomes uh, the, the low carbon energy capital of the world. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you back here on October 16th. October 23rd, we'll talk about hydrogen and October 30th, we'll talk about the circular plastics economy. With that, thank you all for joining. And again, once again, thanks to the panel and Scott for the fantastic discussion. Thank you.